Liste ya va a por algo para la compañía IBM. También yo no que estará con nosotros Mark Heckler, que es el Principal Technologist y Spring Developer at Home. Y eh, los nuevos panelistas que vamos a conocer a continuación son Oledo Cuca, que es un ingeniero de software, consultor enfocado en sistemas. Enfocado en sistemas distribuidos de Java. E Igor Suhorokov. Lo intenté, lo intenté. <ríe> Él es un profesional de la máquina virtual de Java experimentado en software, open source en framework. Entonces ellos son nuestros panelistas y quien será el moderador de este panel de Java Microservices y Tecnologías de Cloud es Carlos Paulino. Un fuerte abrazo para ellos. Hi everybody, my name is Carlos, and I'm going to be helping moderate uh, this panel. Um, well, the remote's not working, so that's there, it's that. Versus functionality, which is very stagnant and stable. Um, the other thing I would point out is that Java is a few different things. Java is a language, yes, which is a superb language. It has decades of investment in that language, and, and it has multiple platforms and outlets for that. But it's also an ecosystem. And the ecosystem are things like the JVM, the additional libraries, uh, different garbage collectors, different mechanisms for deployment. So things like um, raw VM is very exciting in some ways, because it reduces your start time from maybe a couple of seconds to 60 or 80 milliseconds. But if you're using, if you're creating a microservice which has a runtime of several minutes or hours or days, does it matter if you go from two seconds to 20 milliseconds? No, not at all. It, it's very important if you're creating something like serverless, a function, a serverless function, that you're going to be spinning up, spinning down within less than a second. That's, that startup time is absolutely critical. But if you, uh, with anything, when you go to static compilation, you lose certain things. And as we've seen, the JVM is very good at optimization while it's running. So things tend to get faster and operate better while it's running. So in some cases, compiling to native is brilliant. It absolutely fits the problem domain. In other cases, it actually works against you. So it's important that we don't take our brain out of it and, and choose something because of a buzzword, it's important we still decide when to apply this technology or that technology because for the foreseeable future, we're going to be dealing with both. I know in Spring, we are working closely with the Graalvi and engineers, as I'm sure every framework is, uh, to make sure that everything works well. But we also have some capabilities that Graalvi simply can't deliver at this point. So over time, you'll probably see the delta diminish, uh, but I think, it, again, it's very important that you consider your use cases. Yeah, I guess I can, can't add anymore because everything was, was say about, uh, about Java, the importance of Java as an ecosystem to build uh, our microservices, but what I can add to summarize everything is the idea the, uh, that you can write once and run it everywhere. This is the most important about Java because this is the same ecosystem which could be run on, for example, your Intel's processor and then it could behave in the same way on your ARM processor without any additional um, time investment on re-implementing re something because you have already everything from GVM side and so you can just run your the same jar file and it will be working on a different ecosystem. This is the most coolest part of, of Java. That's why we have to consider uh, consider it to, to offer as an ecosystem to provide our microservices. In turn, lots of languages nowadays are running on top of GVM, which makes it more available for us. So you can run the same coupling on GVM, you can run Ruby, you can run even JavaScript on, on GVM. This is amazing. I don't, I have never seen other ecosystem that could do the same. That's why I think GM and Java is really important for us. Perfect. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, moving on to the third item. For many years, um, 
Enterprise development teams have built their applications using Java EE. Um, you know, building very large monolithic applications over containers without much regard for the, for the modules or the components. The question now is, what is the future for Java EE or Jakarta EE for cloud native applications? Yeah, I can, I can take up that question. So what is the future? Um, uh, very good question, yes. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, Java EE usage or even J2 EE usage in the past. And for me, the most important uh, or most interesting aspect of the whole Java EE uh, ecosystem are the specifications and especially the APIs um, um, that a lot of uh, developers know. For example, things like JAXRS, CDI, JPA, a lot of things we use, all of us use either directly or indirectly um, in Enterprise Java. And what we see, so first of all, what I think is very interesting, that a lot of people connect the idea that, you know, Java EE is something slow, legacy, heavyweight, which first of all, it's, I mean, it's just specifications and, and APIs, and a lot of people connect, you know, like, slow old implementations with that. But what we see, especially right now already, like as of today, is a lot of very modern and innovative runtimes, um, things like Open Liberty, which is um, super fast and very innovative, and things like Quarkus, if you have heard of that from, from Red Hat, which is a very interesting approach, especially for the cloud native, that builds upon job enterprise technologies, these standards like CDI, JAXOS, and so on. So this is what we have um, right now in order to actually already build cloud native um, applications if you want, so it's totally possible as of today. Um, what we see in the future, where this is going, so it's very interesting, is that in the Eclipse Foundation, Java EE is going to continue as Jakarta EE, and that whole process um, is currently you know, building up. So similar things to uh, what we had in the, uh, the JCP needs to be like, formalized, like uh, to have some proper um, processes involved, and you know how to craft the future standards uh, within the Eclipse Foundation. So this is uh, this is what we see. Um, and yeah, we pretty much uh, like have the support of uh, all the vendors in, in, involved, like the you know, typical vendors from which you've got application service in the past. So I think that is a very important aspect as well that somewhat makes up the standard um, technology in terms of that you have a lot of interest on multiple sites. So it's not just one a single vendor; it's like you know multiple who collaborate, and the collaboration is, uh, in, in general is, is always important. Um, in order, you know, to craft better technologies and in order to get support, not just from, from one side. And this is you know, what, what the picture looks uh, uh, like right now. And then in the future, well, we're going to see what, how that's going to look like, how that's happening. Um, so right now, I can't really comment that much on, on the current status, but that's pretty important. And um, Jakarta EE will um, involve in, within the Eclipse Foundation. With MicroProfile, it's similar. It's also in the Eclipse Foundation, and right now it's um, right now it's being discussed whether uh, MicroProfile will be an incubator for um, Jakarta EE, and then solely based on that, uh, that technology, or more ha having its own route. You know, in terms of how the how the innovation happens in these standards. That's that very nice. Thanks. I would just add that. Um, in the Java platform itself, in the Java SC platform, we're looking at ways to optimize um, for Java Nano replacing JMI. So that's something that's being worked within OpenJDK itself to make Java the ideal platform for deploying cloud-based applications. Nice. And what else? Yeah. All right. Let's move to the next item. So going forward from Java EE or Jakarta to cloud native applications can be very complex and challenging for developers and organizations. The question is, what kind of steps um, do you need to take in order to um, shift from existing Java EE applications into um, cloud native applications? Okay, well, I'll start this one out. Go to start, let's bring that I.O. I'm kidding. I'm supposed to say that. No, I, I, I burned my key. I'll get paid. So anyway, um, I'm... I, <laughs> okay. Uh, seriously, though, I, I think if you're looking at modernizing, uh, Java EE is dead. Jakarta EE is the future. Uh, 
and, and Sebastian Freelich come to that really well. What I will say, what I will add to that, is that um, when Oracle was in charge of John E. and shepherding it, and guiding it, and determining what went in these release largely uh, and what didn't, uh, it had direction, it had purpose, and it was easy even if you disagreed with that direction, there was somebody to point to. There was an entity that you could say, hey, Oracle, I don't like what you're doing here. Hey, that's not the right direction to be going in. It's been free, uh, which is, is a great opportunity for the community. Now, obviously, the screen community would love to have you. If you're using screen grade, that's all. That's perfect. If you're, if you're still working with Java E, Jakarta E, that's, that's great too. But do get involved. Because without that single focal point, and I, I know the Eclipse Foundation has stepped up, which is great, that's the home. And you have several other vendors who are stepping up and contributing, and that's great too. But without a single, you, you may have heard the expression, a single throat to choke, without that single point of contact, the person to praise or blame, as a person but the entity to praise or blame, it would be easier for things to just kind of lose momentum. So if you're involved in that community, please do get more involved. If you're not, please do get involved. Because ultimately, the success or failure, well, successes or failures of job E and Jakarta E are all on us now, right? So if you don't get involved, look in the mirror, tell yourself, it's, it's, it's my fault. Uh, so, so that's what I would say at this point is, get involved, help migrate things forward, get involved in efforts. Uh, if you're, again, if you're not in the screen ecosystem, if you are, it's kind of probably silly to say, but if you aren't, get involved with efforts like microprofile and things like that because they help advance the industry, they help advance Jakarta E and what it will be in the future, not what we're looking back at in years past. Yeah, thanks for saying I can totally second that, um, especially uh, getting involved. Um, as, well, for multiple reasons. So, so first of all, if you're getting involved in the current you know, process, how the future is being built, then you know what the future looks like. You can actually help creating it. And um, especially if you have, for example, if you're using specific technologies or you're using you know, specific um, things in your projects and then you see at where the current path, uh, you see the current path where the technology is going, and then you might have, uh, find some issues, for example, oh, this is not going to work with X or with or work with this new cloud native technology that we have, and then especially you can, you know, uh, contribute that back, you can create these issues, you can create, uh, raise the awareness, and then you will just improve all of it, right, because you, already can try it out or you can already have a look at for example micro profile and then you see the rough direction where that is going and you can provide feedback and i can tell it from experience from whether it's you know uh, with an ibm open source or anything that is in, in java or jacardi everybody involved is very very happy to receive feedback feedback is always appreciated even if you think i'm all oh, i'm just a regular developer and this is this you know uh, whatever specification you need or whatever we might have. No, everybody is super happy to receive the feedback and to answer questions, especially if you raise the awareness to specific issues, because a lot of you know, people who just draft in the specifications don't have all of that knowledge and all of that experience of how technology is being used in real world projects. And if you have a real world project and see, okay, this might not you know, work for us because of X, then raising that awareness is very, very important. And of course, it helps just building up the knowledge of the technology for yourself as well. And that's a very good way to just learn about it on one's job. So, I encourage everybody to, to contribute. I always go back to the quote the best way to predict the future is to create the future. I was thinking about the same <laughs> That's good advice for, the, for these guys. Remember that. Um, now, and then moving on to the next item. So, in, in recent times, there are new technologies um, such as um, functions as a service that are made, emerging as the evolution of cloud native technologies. So, the question would be what are the new differentiators between microservices and servers or um, functions as services technologies? First of all, we need to remember that uh, service list is uh, more uh, easy to deploy and uh, cloud provider uh, provide
this ability to optimize uh, resources as, as much as possible. So from uh, developer perspective, this is uh, very easy to integrate uh, function as a service uh, in application and uh, you don't need uh, to remember how, how to initialize application how to you just package it uh, as a container and uh, put in the position and uh, just uh, provides uh, scaling capabilities that's all uh, but uh, in this uh, use case uh, startup time really So it's a crucial part of this uh, solution. So uh, we need to optimize application for startup time, and uh, we also need to provide uh, as much statistic as possible to prevent to, to prevent uh, long ago uh, of application. So ahead of time, com compiling is uh, solution. Uh, on the screen team, we kind of look at things as this kind of vast continuum. Uh, because if you if you think if you're looking at your micro, your monolithic world and thinking, well, if I break this into microservices, there'll be some degree of chaos here. Think how much more chaotic if you break each of your microservices down into a few hundred different functions. So so I think you have to look at it in in context, right? Uh, and when we talk about functions as a service or serverless, we're, we blur those two concepts. But really, they're two concepts. They're complementary many times, but they're two distinct concepts. And that serverless is really about resource utilization and scaling. It's about instantaneous startup, shutdown, scaling with perhaps innumerable instances. Uh, it's not re using resources when they're not active. That's not being billed for resources when they're not active. Uh, and in many cases, it's a very granular bit of functionality we want to execute. So whether we're using Java or some other terrible option um, outside of the Java ecosystem, <laughs> he who shall not be named, or she who shall not be named. Um, but but the, the point is that you're not typically going to have an overly complex, vast amount of technology, a vast amount of functionality that you're going to shoehorn into a function. You're going to, to have a, a very succinct piece of capability that you're going to put as, in as a function. So if you're thinking in terms of, of functionality, you're talking at a much smaller scale. And, and again, I kind of think about uh, a microservice that if you're going to be running this thing for a few days or hours or even several minutes at a time, startup time isn't that important. Um, the, the ability to define it in a function may be a bit difficult because you may have Again, a little more complexity involved. Um, so so you're, you're kind of looking at complementary options, not, not always mutually exclusive, but certainly complementary. You're going to probably be using some functions and some microservices, and you'll probably still, for the foreseeable future, have some monoliths that are still running. Now, coming back to the resource part, but the serverless part, in that we, we have a bit of functionality or a lar large amount of functionality that the, the system just creates uh, some kind of an executing environment, runs it, and then stops it. Uh, I mean, there was a really good tweet that a person threw out last week saying the original serverless platform was Heroku. I think many times we forget it, and a good friend of mine from Google had mentioned a year or two ago the Google Cloud Platform basically puts your instances to sleep when it's not running. So even with a microservice, it's serverless because it shuts it down and you're not being billed and so on and so forth. Obviously, you know, you have different options available. But, but the point, I guess, is coming back to things like uh, Cloud Foundry, IBM's, uh, Bluemix, uh, Pivotalist Cloud Foundry, and things like that. You have, in most cases, had the ability to provide an application have the platform build the executing environment around it and deploy it for you to scale it automatically, even down to zero. Uh, so in many cases, serverless is an evolution of functionality we've all had access to for years. We just didn't always realize it. Functions are a bit different, but again, that's more a matter of scoping and and um, and perhaps you know 
the ability to have a, a bit of, of code that executes quickly and shuts down. But again, it's not it's not a direct correlation. Perfect. And I think I can totally um, agree with that. And especially I agree with the, uh, the, the distinction you can make between like serverless quote unquote, which means just get another buzzword and service. Um, because what we as developers, you can, you know, if you have a project where that is like properly managed in terms of that you build up a whole environment of how you ship your code or your behavior to production, then in many ways you can be like serverless in terms of that is everything is managed for you and you literally just write a uh, business behavior in code and then everything else is, for example, automated, right? And then you have a whole uh, continuous delivery pipeline that does everything for you. You literally just write that code and then you can build up a serverless solution using Job Enterprise or using Spring, even if it's not, you know, like buzzword compatible, serverless or whatever you might call that. Um, when it comes to startup time, yes, that is one of the uh, issues that when you want like scalability at scale, but that's also, especially when it comes to issue once you uh, really want to scale to zero, um, and if not, then you can very easily mitigate it with uh, many solutions out there. And that's, yeah, that's basically what I see. So I um, also agree what uh, Mark said about like, complexity of functions, functions as a service especially, because for most projects you, Again, really need to ask the question, what, what are we trying to do? Which problem are we trying to solve? And usually, what you then need to do in the application is more complex than, you know, just as a stateless hello world uh, example that you can quite, do quite quickly uh, with functions as a service with all the complexity that you have to need in the application. And then again, it's just a question of what you should use in order to solve the problem. And I like the approach that um, Mark mentioned of maybe you have some situations where you have specific technology that does that very job well. You have some small functionality but actually makes sense to fit some function as a service with a very simple um, stateless um, functionality, for example, and the rest of the application might be a more traditional, um, more state a full approach or you know, an application that is, uh, runs longer and things like that. So again, I would not focus on hype. I would focus on, okay, what we're trying to solve and how can we improve the, the quality and you know, the speed in terms of moving fast, how we ship our software, and how we solve the problem for the clients. Thanks again. Now, our final question. Um, it's, what's coming in the near future for Java? What about, are there any long-term plans for, for the Java ecosystem? How about um, future versions of Java putting more attention to microservices, controllers, and mobile devices? I'm sorry, I didn't see this question again, so I'll, I'll answer as best as I can, because I missed all the rest of it. Uh, <laughs> so, I think I mentioned, um, as far as the platform goes, there are several projects um, being worked on with the community in OpenJDK, so um, all you know, OpenJDK contributors are working on it together, and of course it's open to contributors, so if you want to join, you could, but some of the highlights that I shared that I think pertain most to this question are around containers. So Project Portola is looking at that, so how to optimize Java in a world of containers, make it the number one optimal choice. Um, so that's a great project to get involved in and to follow and to provide use cases and feedback. So joining Project Portola. Um, also um, Project Panama, um, so looking at Project Panama and optimizing it for um, big data, machine learning, um, looking at, um, we're also looking at, what's another project that I mentioned tonight? Project Valhalla, value types, object data layout. Um, so in, in Project, um, in OpenJDK as well, they're looking at replacements for JNI. Um, so again, also keeping in mind number one priority is security, um, and then looking at how we can modernize, but modernizing carefully and bringing in innovations. So that's the idea with the six month release cycle, right? Then we'll bring in innovations more quickly to the platform so that developers can adapt them, adopt them more quickly to build applications, but without being disruptive to people so they can kind of adapt 
their Java development teams to be a little bit more iterative and agile and continuous delivery. Um, so that's some of the directions that we're going in terms of the overall Java platform. But again, open to contributions and comments and feedback from the community. And I shared with you earlier this morning how you can do that. Thanks so much. One thing, if I could add, um, <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, Project Loom is, is very exciting to me personally. Uh, if, if, please do, uh, my colleague, my teammate, Josh Long, is going to, I think he's presenting on Reactive, Reactive Revolution this afternoon, one of his talks. Uh, if you get a chance, please do take that in, uh, because have any of you ever been asked to do less with more? It's always the other way, right? We're always asked to do more with less. And Java's means for scaling has been very easily understood for years, but yet, at least conceptually, I'll put it that way. Uh, but it's, it's not been as efficient as it could be, perhaps, for resource utilization. And reactive uh, programming gives us, and reactive streams in particular, a way to extract more scalability and sometimes more performance. I, I say that as a caveat because it depends, again, on how your applications are written. But it gives you more bang for your buck with existing Java. And if you're using Kotlin, you probably know about coroutines, if you know Java Project Loom. Uh, these are, I don't want to call them half steps, but they don't address flow control. But what they do address is the ability, again, to do more with less with your code. What Loom and coroutines give you is a more, is a, is a stepping up point where you can keep your code largely the same imperative code that you've written with some minor changes and get the benefits of asynchronicity uh, without the pain typically experienced by right, asynchronous coding. Um, if you're willing to go all the way to the end, you can go to reactive uh, streams and reactive programming, which gives you even more uh, scalability as well. But again, we're talking about things that are, are making their way into Java or in Kotlin. Uh, we have capabilities and, and, and tools for now. Nola can probably talk more about that, but that's personally very exciting because we've seen some of these things uh, that are very common in alternative universes, which all your name nameless, uh, but with other problems as well. And now I think as an industry we've matured enough to see the benefits that other particular environments offer and to look at them and how best they fit our world and to leverage them in ways that perhaps are really much, much better than they're being leveraged even in the places that they started. Well, also one uh, very interesting uh, besides that is uh, all the uh, initiatives and the uh, innovation that uh, we see by uh, implementations. For example, um, there is OpenJ9. Um, there is an alternative JVM that has very interesting um, approaches and, and concepts uh, in terms of optimizing uh, Java further on the implementation side uh, in many regards to cloud native applications. For example, when it comes to um, when it comes to using the, the resources more effectively. And doing things like in the past we had JIT just in time compilation with Hotspot and things like that. And now also doing AOT ahead of time compilation, trying to figure out some things that um, have built in compile time to further optimize from the start of your applications, how they are being laid out natively and how they can be made you know, quicker and with better resource consumption. And there are other approaches there as well, which are very interesting. For example, we can um, share some like, classes, how they are laid, are laid out natively in your running JVM. If you, for example, have a high scale um, environment with many, many instances, and all of these JVM instances are doing the same thing, you can share and you know, combine some efforts. Or um, OpenJ9 has some um, approaches how to do um, a JIT just in time as a service. So where you literally run that JIT as a server that other um, JVMs can connect to, because again, if you do a high scale um, uh, deployment of many, many instances, then again, all these JVMs have to do the same work, and you can literally outsource their, that to a single point. And you know, very interesting initiatives um, as follows, so you can have a look at the, that open source alternative JVM OpenJ9, uh, which I think is just very interesting to see that also on the implementation side, it's still evolving a lot. That you know helps the whole ecosystem, of course. It's just that as the hotspot did, and that's the reason why Java runs that fast with this performance, with native performance, uh, basically. And it's, this is a huge improvement for the whole Java ecosystem to make sure that the Java stays relevant also in the future. Yeah.
the dawn is if you can just add cushion to everything. Java will have future, this obvious. So you don't have to be afraid about the future of the Java because first of all, nowadays behind the Java stands too many companies which continue continuously support it, improve it and provides more and more future. And yeah, it could take a little bit of time to deliver all of them, but it's most important that we take a look at what's going on in, in the world and then we collect all the experience that others have already been collected so you can just imagine the Kotlin implemented curtains, how many pitfalls they have already collected so that you can just easily take a look what they did and improve it or do a little bit more, much more better yeah, than they do, for example, for fibers or for Project Loom. And this means that we slowly move into the future and it means that the future will be better for Java and for all GVM systems. Because yeah, again, yeah, lots of companies stand behind and continue to do it. Right. Thank you so much. Everybody, so the take out take out from this is that Java's great for pretty much everything. Um, I would like to thank uh, Mark, Igor, Heather, um, Sebastian and Ola for their time. Everybody let's give a, a, a warm round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.